Hey everyone, Chris Earle here again with another Geog217 lecture. Hope everyone's doing well, and I hope you're ready for lecture number three. So this is going to be 3A, and today we're going to be talking about sexuality and urban life. So it's a topic that's actually really important to me, and it can be extremely enlightening. It can get to the core of our humanity in cities. Urban environments play an extremely important role in helping us as humans express ourselves, explore our interests, and make a home for both ourselves and the people that we love. But the urban environment has also been manipulated and changed to prevent people from acting on their desires, finding comfort in their community, or from living outside a very narrow definition of what is considered right, moral, and acceptable. So to that end, I'll be discussing morality in the city, crackdowns on public sex and expressions of desire, and the changing nature of gay villages and where queer folks live. Throughout this lecture, I'll be talking about distinct sexual communities and how each will come to experience the city. This means highlighting the difference between those who identify as straight and those who identify as queer. Here I'll be using the common parlance when it comes to defining groups. Sexuality is certainly a spectrum and it includes a wide variety of experiences, identities, and feelings. And it's difficult to capture all of those when discussing larger trends within the urban environment. So, in general, when I refer to the straight community, I'm referring to people who identify as a majority heterosexual. And when I refer to the queer community, I'm referring to anybody who is outside of that. Queer is a term that I prefer, and that I see as a holistic and inclusive term that can highlight the shared experiences that people from a diverse array of sexual identities have had. So as with other aspects of human identity, sexuality and sexual behaviors of humans have been fundamentally shaped by urban environments, and those environments have understandably been shaped by our sexual activity. One of the main reasons for this is because scholars of sexuality assert that as humans, our sexual activities aren't merely biological necessity, but are also strongly influenced by the actions, rituals, and behaviors that come from our cultures and our communities. So here's a bit of a brief refresher on the urban environment and identity. Humans derive their identity from a multiplicity of sources. Our identity is made up of facets of our own personality, is handed to us by our culture, is derived from our places, it's affiliated with our beliefs, and or the learned social, cultural, and identity-based groups with which we associate. And so, our sexual activities, from the basics of flirting and expressing interest in another person, to our ideas about what constitutes an acceptable expression of our sexuality, can be strongly influenced by our culture and the other groups with which we affiliate. The urban environment becomes a major conduit for the transference of these ideas. And as urban environments house a wide array of people, it allows us to more readily come into contact with the groups that we feel will best instruct us into how we are supposed to act sexually. If you'll remember back to our lectures on both immigration and deviance, large urban centers offer people more opportunities to come into contact with people who share their experiences and their interests. Both inside and outside the city, from the Industrial Revolution right up until the Second World War, no influence has been stronger over much of the world than those of organized religions. In many cities around the world, it was Christian churches and other religious organizations with their affiliation to the colonizing powers of Europe who began to impose standards of morality onto the city. A lot of major world religions did this deriving their social beliefs about what constitutes acceptable behavior from both ancient sources and the beliefs of their leadership. This has played out in the urban environment in many striking ways. The prominence of religions, the fusing of religious morals and public policy, and the imposition on entire urban populations of religious moral standards with regard to gender roles, prohibitions on sexual activity outside of monogamous, faith-sanctioned marriages, and firm opposition to queer expressions of love were commonplace in much of early modern history. While many religious organizations began to move away from moralizing crusades and in the past few decades openly welcomed people of many different backgrounds into their fold, the ways that these standards of morality shaped urban environments was rather intense. Okay, so video got a bit screwy. Sorry about that. So what was cut out here is essentially this. 
Despite this, urban areas remained a place of safe refuge for members of the queer community, especially those who came from more rural areas. See, rural areas, if you'll remember back to our lecture on identity in the city, are more homogenous and tight-knit, and they often come to rely on institutions such as organized religions for more conservative social and political groups that result in a more conservative social philosophy being more prevalent amongst members of rural communities. Again, this isn't passing judgment, this is simply in reference to the specific nature of rural areas. Uh, so hopefully that fits in pretty well here, uh, but in essence that's, that's kind of just what got cut out. Sorry. Okay, back to it. Individuals from the queer community in these areas can feel isolated, marginalized, or discriminated against. Kath Weston, in the excellent piece, Get Thee to a Big City, which I'll source at the end, references this in the opening paragraphs, discussing an instance where a folk singer prominent in the feminist movement in the 1970s by the name of Meg Christian took the stage at an event in San Francisco and, right in the middle of a song, made a call to the crowd. Weston writes, quote, The singer paused to comment on the difficulties of growing up gay in a rural area. Her advice to onlookers who had friends or relatives still struggling to come out in the countryside, tell them to take the next bus or train to a big city. Whistles, cheers, and nodding heads greeted this clarion call." End quote. This of course is nothing new. For as long as there have been cities, there have been queer folks calling those cities home. Author Peter Ackroyd, in the book Queer City, uh, writes of accounts of queer men in London at the time of Roman colonization and conquest of the British Isles. But as stricter moral standards were applied to larger society, queer people needed to hide more and more of their identity in order to survive. It was often easier for queer to folks to maintain a double life, keeping up expected social appearances in some instances, while still pursuing intimacy and companionship that they desired. And in larger cities where anonymity made it easier to hide yourself, and the sheer number of people made it more likely that you'd be able to find somebody in, com in your community, well, in these places, queer culture thrived. There are two stories of queer men from the early history of Toronto that are interesting, and they look into how queer folks navigated love and life in early Canadian cities. These stories and much of the information on Toronto actually comes from a really excellent anthology, uh, which is called Any Other Way, How Toronto Got Queer, edited by a massive team of authors. The first story is of George Markland. Markland was a prominent political figure in the early days of Toronto. He served on the executive council of what was then Upper Canada and was deeply connected to the, coloni uh, the colony's growing aristocratic class, which was called the Family Compact. And this was because of how close and nepotistic they seemed. They weren't actually a family. Markland was a rising star in the government until about 1838, when an investigation into Markland was opened by his peers. See, there have been rumors that Markland maintained what they called inappropriate relationships with some of the soldiers who were stationed at Fort York. An inquiry heard that he was frequently seen acting in a feminine way, and he was maintaining physical contact with soldiers for far too long. A housekeeper in the parliament buildings where he worked said that she had heard him and another person engaging in scandalous activities in his office. After she saw a drummer from the garrison at Fort York quickly leave his office, she confronted Markland and is reported to have said to him, quote, Well, sir, these are queer doings from the bottom to the top. End quote. If she had made that statement now, rather than 182 years ago, she'd be writing jokes for Drag Race right now. By the way, season 12? Oh my god. <laughs> drama. <clears throat> but this is the drama we're focused on. There were allegations that this inquiry against Markland was simply drew due to his shifting political loyalties. In any regard, it actually worked in shaming Markland from public life. He resigned his offices and moved back to Kingston in 1838, and then he died in obscurity. See, Markland actually never faced a formal trial, and that was likely because of how well politically connected he was. But another early Torontonian, did face a trial. This is a man by the name of Richard Yeo. He was a dance teacher who helped Torontonian socialites brush up on their dancing skills mm -hmm. in an effort to impress their friends and occupy their time in the cold, brutal winter nights of early Toronto. In 1840, Yeo was arrested after a run-in with soldiers at the barracks on King Street, 
Apparently, he was somewhat inebriated, and Yo propositioned a soldier, and admittedly wasn't actually taking no for an answer. He was arrested after attempting to take liberties with the soldier, and was sentenced to a year in jail for his crime. And after that, he would be placed on a ship and deported from Canada entirely. So because of his status, George Markland was able to just go back home to Kingston and fade away. But Yo, because he was a much poorer man, because he didn't have the same connections that Markland did, was imprisoned and deported from the colony entirely. The class disparities in cities at the time meant that queer folks in different social situations would be treated very differently. If one had the money and the connections, they could carry on expressing themselves in a careful way, unless, as was the case with Markland, they started making politically connected enemies. If one was poor, and without connections to those in the upper echelons of society, like poor Mr. Yo, then even the city was a dangerous place for queer folks. Further stories from Toronto show that even in urban areas, life for people trying to express themselves in a sexual way was very difficult. A series of accounts taken from police records in 1917 show that the policing of gay men in particular was of primary concern for urban police forces. Police records actually show that from March 30th to April 29th, 1917, mostly Friday and weekend nights, police would watch as gay men, almost all of them closeted, and the majority of them with wives and families, would meet in a back alley off Young Street. It's presently where today's Eaton Center is. In total, they arrested 13 men, who would later be sentenced to be between 1 and 18 months in prison. Most of the men were workers. All of them were urban residents. Some were recent immigrants, unable to even speak English. But they sought out experiences and connections boldly, and in defiance of the moralizing standards of the time. These men, unfortunately, would pay the price for that. Toronto, like many cities around the world at the time, maintained a separate branch of the police that was known as the Morality Division. It was sometimes referred to as the Morality Police, and these individuals were tasked with ensuring people followed a very rigid social code in the city. Mainly, the Morality Police were mostly concerned with the conduct of women in public. They wanted to ensure that women weren't dancing with men who paid for their drinks because they saw it as a slippery slope to prostitution. They policed recreation and leisure activities, especially those happening on Sunday, to ensure that people weren't having too much fun on the Lord's Day. And they were always concerned with issues of public drunkenness and gambling. But a frequent target of the morality police were members of the queer community. Police would target men, even those with the luxury of having their own homes or spaces for engaging in consensual sexual acts. See, many of, the, many of these acts happened in public, I know what you're thinking, this is public sex and that's still illegal today, and you're right. But for queer folks, gay men and trans people in particular, acting sexually, even in the privacy of your own home, was forbidden. Throughout the United States, for example, many cities passed anti-gay housing ordinances. These were local laws that indicated if a person was found engaging in any same-sex sexual activities even in rental housing or in public accommodations, this would be grounds for eviction. And as I previously mentioned, the police in Canada considered same-sex sexual activity, whether it happened in public or in the privacy of one's own home, as illegal. Other gay men, like those discussed in the Toronto example from 1917, they were married and they were leading double lives, so they couldn't bring sexual partners home. It required them to seek out companionship in places that were away from their homes again, often in public. Queer sexual activity for many decades migrated to public and commercial places. This would allow for brief contact in a secondary location and the community around which you could actually have people alert you to the presence, the, the comings and goings of unwanted visitors. Despite this, these kinds of public expressions further attracted the eyes of moralizing figures who wanted to keep cities sanitized and free from what they saw as unnatural behaviors. See, these behaviors would occur in what David Bell would refer to as the country of the city, positing that these places in urban settings where queer sexual connections would occur were seen as the uncivilized parts of cities. This references the placing of queerness as unnatural and uncivilized and outside the refined 
organized and civilized city. One place that queer sexual activities would occur was public parks and public washroom facilities. These kinds of public spaces have historically been frequented by queer men and trans folks in particular for the act of cruising for sex. Public parks and washrooms, while well, spaces intended for the public, have been used as spaces of intimacy and have been contested sites over moral regulation. Parks could often provide the right amount of cover to get a bit of privacy, but allow for enough open sight lines to be alerted to the presence of others, individuals who are walking around or police officers. These kinds of activities in public parks were cause for panic among many members of society. Fears over cruising in parks and how they manifested in public policy can still be seen in the urban landscape today, and a notable example of that is Montreal. From 1954 to 1986, with just a four-year break between 57 and 1960, Montreal was under the tight control of Mayor Jean Drapeau. Drapeau was a pro-business mayor who was instrumental in securing a lot of things for Montreal, like Expo 67, the Montreal Olympics in 1976, and the Montreal Metro. He even created the modern lottery system in Canada. But he was very socially conservative and responded to the cries from the city's right-leaning press about how to deal with what they saw as an epidemic of public sex and vice in the city. Montreal's public parks, most notably the Frederick Law Olmsted-designed Mount Royal Park, were reshaped during Drapeau's tenure as mayor thanks to fears over queer sex. In the 1950s and 60s, Drapeau ordered Mount Royal Park to be redesigned in a process that's colloquially referred to as the morality cuts. This is named as such thanks to the deforestation of selected parts of the park to create what was seen as a more legible, open, and surveillable park. Drapeau and the city's conservative establishment viewed the park, in particular, a heavily forested area at the corner of Mount Royal Avenue and Park, labeled the jungle in the city's press, as a den of sin in what they saw as frighteningly close proximity to a playground. As historian Matthew Carrion notes, at times, newspapers described the jungle as infested with drunkards, criminals, or a seemingly interchangeable collection of sex maniacs, perverts, and homosexuals." End quote. Drapeau's morality cuts fundamentally reshaped Mount Royal Park. The area where the jungle was is today around the monument to the father of Confederation, Sir George Etienne Cartier. That space, as many of you well know, is now a wide open grassy plain. It's perfect for summer nights just lounging around or drum circles. There's a forested area of the park that remains, but to this day, it still suffers from a lot of invasive species of flora that have flourished because of the morality cuts. These kinds of actions aren't just things of the past. Police today still do surveillance in public parks in the hopes that they'll find queer sexual expression occurring within. In 2016, in Toronto, police conducted a sting operation in Marie Curtis Park. They arrested 76 men that they suspected of engaging in public sex. But in a sign that things are actually starting to change, a group of lawyers banded together to represent the individuals arrested, and the judges found that the police actually had no evidence of this and they dismissed every charge. As one of the lawyers wrote during the event, quote, the sting and its resulting charges rightly provoke a visceral reaction from many, bringing up feelings of guilt and shame and pride and resilience. They are a reminder of every indignity and also a reminder of our strength in the face of all that happens to us, end quote. Another prominent place sexual activity would occur would be in commercial establishments of cities, particularly those that served queer clientele. Movie theaters, bars, and bathhouses became sites for queer folks to engage in sexual exp expression and privacy. As these places were businesses, they were in the interesting position of actually being regulated by municipal governments. The city had a direct role in facilitating queer sexual expression. And when they were licensed, well, that made the city government a partner in these sorts of activities. The great science fiction writer Samuel Delaney outlined in his book of essays about being a queer black man in New York City, entitled Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, the interactions between people in these places were out of necessity and out of a desire to find community. He wrote, quote, occasionally men expected money, but most often not. Many encounters were wordless, 
Now and again, though, one would blossom into a conversation lasting hours, especially with those men less well-off, the out of work, or the homeless with nowhere else to go." End quote. Delaney writes about how theaters, particularly those that were playing a mix of gay and straight porn, became places for people of all different backgrounds, classes, and ways of expressing themselves to meet. Delaney, a professor and writer, talked about meeting doctors and construction workers, bankers and homeless men in these theaters, which became places for those without somewhere to express themselves, or those just seeking community, a place to get by and act together. Delaney's essay came during the AIDS epidemic, which New York City used in the 1990s as a justification for shuttering the porn theaters and other sexual establishments in the city. These sites were quickly turned over to developers, which hinted at ulterior motives for their closure. In Toronto, the scene played out much differently. Queer bathhouses, which are gyms and saunas where queer folks, usually cisgendered men, but sometimes cisgendered women and trans folks, go to meet engage in sexual activity, or just relax in the steam room. The same Toronto police, who in the early 1900s employed morality police, had been engaging in surveillance of bathhouses and places they suspected queer men of having sex through the 1970s and early 1980s. On February 5th, 1981, the police stormed four bathhouses in the middle of the night. They tore the places up, beat the patrons, and arrested almost 300 people, dragging them out onto the cold Toronto night, and publicly humiliating them before waiting newspaper cameras. This event, which was codenamed Operation Soap by the Toronto Police, sparked a massive protest. On March 6th, the first event in Toronto Pride history occurred, called a Gay Freedom Rally, in response to the police brutality and their discriminatory actions. The way that the city acted next acknowledged the importance of protecting the queer community. And the Toronto police would take them a while, but by 2016 actually apologize for their role in the bathhouse raids. Crackdowns on public sex aside, queer spaces in cities have been changing dramatically over the past few decades. Again, going back to Kath Weston, Kath Weston asserts that throughout the 1970s and 80s, as parts of society, primarily large cities became more and more tolerant and accepting of queer folks, a great gay migration began. This is a period of time when queer folks from small towns and rural parts of North America in particular, or from cities that, because of economic or social circumstances, remained intolerant, would move to large metropolitan centers. In the United States, that meant that queer folks came from all over to move to Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, New York, Miami. In Canada, it was mostly to Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Throughout Europe, this also occurred in different ways, but the largest metropolitan centers still attracted large numbers of queer folks, from London to Paris to Berlin to Amsterdam. Queer folks in cities began to congregate in these areas, and their congregation provided safety, community, and proximity, especially to queer-owned businesses and social service organizations that served the community. These became known as gay villages. There are some notable gay villages that were essential meeting points for the community for decades. New York's Greenwich Village, San Francisco's Castro, Chicago's Boys Town, Schonenberg in Berlin, and the Church in Wellesley area of Toronto. They all became distinct communities in their respective cities. These places were spots of refuge for queer folks who felt they had nowhere else to go. As well, they became sites of political and social activism. The Stonewall Riots in New York City in 1969 to protest police discrimination and the raiding of the eponymous bar, that occurred within the Greenwich Village area. And it was in San Francisco's Castro district that one of the first openly gay political figures in the United States, a local politician named Harvey Milk, would first be elected. Geographers began to actually note the significant economic and social changes happening in gay villages. See, in gay villages, gentrification began to occur more rapidly and with more incredible intensity than it did anywhere else in other parts of the city. The queer inhabitants, who were able to buy property, had more disposable income, and they often cared deeply for the often neglected historical properties in their community. The tight-knit nature of the community meant that many would care for one another in their times of need, and while there was still poverty in gay villages, it took on a very different characteristic than it did elsewhere, thanks to the support of the wider community. As time marched on, these areas became incredible sites of tourism. 
So the public wanted to invest. Public officials dropped a lot of money into gay villages seeking to capitalize on this tourism. In 2002, the economist Richard Florida published a book called The Rise of the Creative Class. It posited that the presence of queer folks, artists, and tech professionals in cities could further drive economic gains and help the city bring in a lot more revenue. This was often thanks to the more disposable income that members of these communities had and the strength of their communities. While the main theories that Florida was advancing have been extremely controversial over time, they've stuck with the economic development departments of cities who see the presence of a queer community as a way to attract businesses. They can say that investing in a city is safe if they see a lot of publicly out and visible members of the queer community because it points to a city being tolerant, progressive, and a good place, a stable place to invest. With the AIDS epidemic and crackdowns on cruising spaces, gay villages with their bars and clubs became the places for people to meet and interact, all in a safe and supported location. But all that began to change in the past few decades. See, there are three important things that have occurred that have radically altered the shape of queer spaces in cities over the past two decades. The first is, of course, the ubiquitousness of technology. See, by 2009, smartphones were everywhere, and in the gay community, so was Grindr. Location-based apps like Grindr, Scrub, and Her allow for people to connect and meet wherever they are. Technology allowed people to meet, chat, and connect with folks from around the world in real time, from the safety and the privacy of their own homes. Suddenly, a queer-specific event, or a bar, or a gay village weren't the only places you could go to meet people. The next was general acceptance. Attitudes towards the queer community have, in many places around the world, radically shifted over the past two decades. While there are still many places in the world where one's queer identity can be criminalized or discouraged, and in places around the world, increasing authoritarianism has used queer folks as scapegoats in their attempts to fabricate battle lines in imaginary culture wars. In many other places, acceptance has become far more widespread. For example, equal marriage. Canada became the fourth country in the world to legalize equal marriage in 2005, after the Netherlands, Belgium, and Spain. Well, marriage equality isn't the only indicator of a society's tolerance. It can show that political leaders have gleaned onto the general trends in a society, which are moving toward acceptance. As such, it's easier for people to remain in their homes, their communities, the places that they love. And they don't need to follow the path that those who came before them did, participating in the great gay migration. And finally, the gentrification that the queer community was responsible for before, well, it caught up to and then surpassed gay villages. Now, gay villages remain trendy places, but the bars, clubs, queer-owned businesses, and community centers that were a draw for people in the community a few decades ago are now under threat as their property values have skyrocketed. The gay bar is becoming a condo. So as people have moved online, felt acceptance in their own community, and gay, gay villages have been slowly eroding thanks to development pressure, Centralized and easily identifiable gay communities in cities have been dwindling. No longer are gay villages the only safe place for queer folks to live, so the queer community has dispersed throughout larger urban centers. Indeed, scholars like Anne's and Redlin actually note that for many rural queer folks now, the city can remain a place where one can find themselves, meet members of their community, and accept who they are, but it still remains very unattractive. The other characteristics of rural life are far more of a draw. So for many queer folks of a rural upbringing, the appeal of the city is how it can be a temporary place to become oneself, but a return to the country can symbolize that final step in accepting and loving who you are. And in many other places, queer folks now feel safe in neighborhoods where they aren't the majority, where there isn't a queer-owned business right down the street, or a service center that will provide for them directly in their neighborhood. The dispersal of queer folks in the urban environment speaks to the general tolerance in society and the acceptance of queer folks in general. The city was, for a very long time, a safe haven for members of the queer community. In many ways, it still remains so today. But the way that queer folks have been experiencing the city has been changing. For many of us, it's now possible for us to be ourselves 
love freely, and live unapologetically wherever we want to call home. So this has been an incredibly brief introduction to sexuality in the city. We've discussed how standards of morality have been applied to the urban environment, how cities have cracked down on public sex and expressions of desire, and how gay villages in particular have eroded and changed as the queer community's place in the urban fabric has also changed. This has only been meant to be a very brief introduction, and hopefully the reading for today will also help inform you. I'm going to put a couple of readings up at the end of this video, as usual, but the reason we're stopping short is because we have to move on to Lecture 3B. 3B is about aging in the city, and it's going to be a much shorter lecture, just another brief introduction into issues of aging, youth, and the way that we all experience the city. So, hopefully everyone's enjoyed this lecture, and hopefully everyone is remaining happy, healthy, and safe, and distant. I know I am. So, until next time, this has been Chris Earl, signing off. No, I got all day.